Good morning and welcome to all. This is another in our series of press conferences, press briefings, uh, aimed at keeping you abreast of what has been happening in this country as we continue to tackle COVID-19. The last time we were with you, we brought only members of the press. But today, what we are going to do is that we are going to share the questions with members of the public some of whom have already begun to send their questions to us via WhatsApp. That number is 256-1023. With us today, we have, again, Dr. Adana Grandison. Dr. Grandison has been intimately involved in the rollout of the home isolation and home quarantine process. And we want to spend our time today looking specifically at that particular process because we know that you have many questions. We are likely to be joined by other doctors as well before we finish this program in about an hour or so. So let's go first of all to Dr. Grandison for an overview of what's been happening with respect to home isolation in Barbados. Dr. Grandison? Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, David, for having us. And I am happy to give an update on the program. Um, as of right now, because we are running a live dashboard, we have 1,486 persons in community, of which we have made at least first contact with 1,186 of those persons. And this is a live dashboard, so it also incorporates persons who have been uh, essentially tested up as close as to yesterday. So we're trying to get all of our persons who have at least not had that first contact for a healthcare provider to initiate contact with them, with the first step being notification. This process really starts from um, the point of swabbing, whether the person has presented to a polyclinic or to, for instance, the gymnasium or even to a private healthcare provider or a mobile testing center, this process begins with swabbing. Once that person is positive, this person is notified by a healthcare professional. At that point in time, they are told of their COVID-19 positive status. And it is a preliminary opportunity for persons to communicate with that doctor to answer any of the initial questions they may have, because for some persons, this is considered essentially bad news. And we want to be able to have persons to ask these questions, the initial questions that you may have, what does this mean for me, et cetera. After that, those persons are handed over to a triage group of persons, a triage group of doctors, nurses, as well as EMTs and paramedics who will go through the process of triaging persons, ensuring that you are safe. Now, it is very important during this triage period that persons declare accurately their status in terms of comorbidities. And I wanted to start on talking about comorbidities first. Comorbidities that are associated with an increased risk of getting severe disease, deteriorating to severe disease profiles for COVID-19 and or causing death are very important for you to declare. These include things like hypertension, diabetes, obesity, chronic kidney disease. Uh, we also have persons in our community who may have, for instance, cancer. All of these are things that we are asking you to declare quite clearly. There are some persons we know in community that may not identify themselves as being a hypertensive or diabetic or suffering from these conditions. However, they may then tell you that for instance, they take medication for the pressure or the sugar. And we want you to be able to tell our doctors when we call to triage that essentially Yes, I am taking some medications and these are what the medications are for. And this is where we need your buy-in. After that, 
doctors will go on or our triage team rather, because it's not only doctors will go on to ask you some questions about your symptoms. And I know this is very, very, very important in the COVID-19 fight. We want to know if you're having something as subtle as a headache or sore throat or just simply feeling unwell. We also want to know if you've had a fever and this is whether you've had a clinically detectable fever by a thermometer or for instance, if you have, in your opinion, felt hotter than normal, where what we do at home, the back of the hand test, or some persons may not even present with an elevated temperature, but they may tell you that they have been experiencing chills. They feel very cold in a setting where they know that normally they would never feel cold. If you have developed things like a cough, if you have developed shortness of breath, if you're having difficulty breathing, all of these things, these are important for you to tell the doctor when the doctor or the medical person, the personnel is essentially triaging you to tell them exactly what you are experiencing. It is only at that point that we can safely and accurately triage you so that we can escalate or maintain your correct, appropriate modality of care. Now, I know there are some persons who are very concerned, very worried, probably about having to get transported to Harsom Point or Black Mangala. There's no need to fear for that because these centers are fully equipped with the relevant and requisite monitoring and interventional materials, oxygen, et cetera, to get you the best care that you can get on the island. We want you to declare early so that we can move you early, intervene early, and treat you early. Now, I want to bring to your attention our stoplight system. There are persons who are green in terms of after we've triaged you, and we think that for now, you are safe. At the time of triage, you are safe. Then there are persons who are yellow. And these are persons that we need to monitor, but most importantly, they need to be properly assessed by our isolation team. This is the isolation team at Harrison Point and Black Mangala. And why is that important? Because these persons have symptoms, they have a comorbidity profile, and we want to ensure that you are safe. And then there are persons who are red. These persons are, are urgent cases, persons that need help. We want to, one, pick up those reds, but most importantly, we want to keep those reds at as low as possible a number. Why? Because we want you to identify early. And then once you have been assessed by our isolation, our central isolation facility, whether it is Black Mangala or Harrison Point, the doctors at those facilities will allow you to know what your clinical status is and what your expectations are. They will either monitor you, keep you there, escalate care, or they may think that you are now some person who's safe to essentially return back into community to continue to isolate. Now I want to go on to the very last part of this entire process, and that is reassessment and then discharge, because everyone wants to know when are you going to go home? When are you going to get to return to community? Now, in terms of your review, your review is dealt by our home isolation. If you are green, it's dealt by our home isolation doctors specifically. We have a team of doctors who are managed by Dr. Brian Charles. And these doctors will either contact you either via telemed or in some cases in person, depending upon the clinical assessment that is done. Now, a lot of persons think that because we have seen internationally, there is a magic number associated with discharge. Some persons think 14 days, some persons think 10 days or 13 days. This is not a magic number for people. This is essentially based solely upon clinical assessment. Assessment, And the reason for this is we can have a person, which we hope that the majority of our persons would be, and we know that this is the case for COVID, where persons can present asymptomatically or presymptomatically, and then they may remain without any sort of symptoms for the entire duration 
of their clinical course. We also have some persons who may start off very good, no symptoms, and then within a few days, they, their status may deteriorate. We want to ensure that you remain safe. Safety is the priority of doctors in Barbados, working at the isolation centers and also working within the home isolation program. Should you deescalate, should you, should your care require escalation and your condition deteriorate, we want to be able to intervene. What does this mean? It means that your course of isolation may be extended. It's not because we want to continue to keep you with us, but we want to make sure that when we allow you to return home and you are free to move back, to move around essentially in community, that you are safely doing so. And this here has public health implications. We want to ensure that you're safe for yourself. We want to ensure that you are safe for your family in the household. And we will also want to ensure that you are safe for the wider community. Now, there are some persons who may not have symptoms who may be in a densely populated home. They may have three, four, five persons in that home, and they're not able to isolate at home, even though they may have no symptoms safely. We are also asking those persons to cooperate with our triage team and allow them to know if that is the situation within your household so that we can keep your family members as safe as possible. If you also happen to have any family members who have not formally tested positive, but you are noticing that they are experiencing symptoms, we want you to let us know so that we can advise those persons where they should seek testing from, whether it's a testing a group of persons coming out to them to get them tested, or if they need to present to the requisite polyclinics or testing centers to get their tests done in an orderly fashion. This is not business as usual here in Barbados. We, as everyone has been seeing, we have had many, many positive cases within the last few days. And we are really asking on your cooperation in community to assist us with getting to our citizens as quickly as possible to ensure their safety. So essentially what am I saying? I am asking you to help us to help you early. Thank you very Thank much, you, Dr. Grandison. And we, we certainly are going to come back to you uh, in the question period. But we also have with us Dr. Anton Best, who is the acting CMO. And Dr. Best, I'd like you to put in perspective exactly where we are, because uh, Dr. Grandison spoke about 1,400 people in community. But of course, when people look at the dashboard, they see a number of people in isolation facilities. Taken together, how many people have we confirmed as being COVID positive in this country so far, when you combine the two. Hi, right, good morning, Ms. Dallas. Uh, let me begin by apologizing for uh, joining you late. I want to say good morning to all persons who are with us. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to say a few words on behalf of the Ministry of Health. So as you're all aware, we are in a dire situation right now. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've had um, a very high incidence or rate of cases of COVID. And if you would permit me, I just want to put, uh, put some perspective on it. If you look at the rate of cases in August or the total number of cases in August of this year, we had 689 cases. In September, we had 3,500 cases of COVID detected. That's a 500% increase in the number of cases. And so far for October, we've had over a thousand cases. So we were already surpassed the total tally for the month of August. Um, I think it was in the dashboard from two days ago that we, sorry about that. It was in the dashboard from two days ago that we reported we had 318 cases. And this is 318 cases in, in a one day period which was significantly higher than the 207 daily case average up until that point. And then in the dashboard for yesterday, we had 300 persons identified um, 
on the sixth, sorry, on the fifth of October. And there's no doubt that the number for today, which will come out much later today, is probably going to be the same. So we have a dire situation on our hands, folks. The Delta variant of COVID is a game changer and has made containment of this virus and of spread extremely difficult. Um, I want to thank Dr. Grandison for her presentation because she's made my work a whole lot easier. But one key theme that I, I want to reiterate that came out in her presentation is the understanding that is required of persons and the cooperation of persons as to what we're dealing with. Um, this is 18 months into the pandemic. We're in the third wave. And, and like I said, right now, the situation is grave because the numbers are going up and it would not be surprising if the incidents went up even further. Um, Ms. Dallas, specifically, you were talking about the numbers in isolation. So what we report in the dashboard are the numbers of person in isolation facilities. What is not reflected in the dashboard is the total number of active cases that we have. And the home isolation project was started because we had no choice but to have persons who were COVID positive in the community. So we have just under 1,500 persons, as was said earlier, in um, isolation in the community. So that has to be added to the figure that's in the dashboard, which was, uh, sorry, I just need to pull it up here, which yesterday was 800. So we have a significant number of active cases of COVID in Barbados. The, the main concern that I have, what I find particularly disconcerting, is the fact that we have a relatively low uptake of vaccines. Vaccines are effective and they're safe. They can reduce transmission risk, but most importantly, they reduce the severity of the disease. Another key theme that came out in Dr. Grandison's uh, presentation before mine is that we're very concerned about the number of people that are dying from COVID. More people are going to die from COVID when there's more spread of COVID in the community. So we really need people to understand what it is that we're dealing with. And while the Ministry of Health is out to all, as well as the isolation facilities, all of QEH, all of the healthcare sector, the public sector, the private sector, and the entire government, we really require that whole of government and whole of society approach. We really require persons in the community to have an understanding as to where we are, why we are here, and what role they play in helping us to combat this deadly pandemic. Back to you as well. Uh, I can say that one big concern which is being expressed by people who are dealing with this problem in Barbados is what some are describing as a high degree of indiscipline. Um, we are seeing a lot of people who are having parties uh, they're trying to beat the system, go underground. Sometimes they are behaving as though uh, it's business as usual. And it must be remembered that this is contributing to the problem that we are facing. It is a major issue now in the country, based on the figures which have been given to you this morning about the number of active cases in Barbados. And therefore, we really want to implore Barbadians to take this matter far more seriously. And a lot has to be done to curb the kind of excessive mixing that has been taking place in the country. You think that it's only going to hit the older people because they're the ones that are dying. But let me tell you, we are waiting for figures for today. And as I walked in here to speak to you this morning, one of the crew members said, that a friend of his in his 30s has died from COVID. We will await more information from Harrison Point. But this isn't somebody who is said to be in their late 30s, early 40s. And therefore, young people are also at risk. Let's go to the media. I'm going to come to the media first, and after that, we're going to take some questions from members of the public. And one of the questions that you will have to answer, uh, Dr. Adana Grandison, is what is triaging? Because 
These terms sometimes confuse people. You medical people uh, believe it's everyday knowledge, but it isn't. So let's come to the media first of all. Good morning. Good morning to you, Mr. Ellis, Wendy Burke, uh, CBC News. Now, we were talking about the numbers that, uh, well, Dr. Grandison was talking about the numbers in home isolation and the issue of triagen and your um, traffic colors, your red, your green, your yellow. Um, in terms of, since this process has started, um, can you tell me what the incidence has been of individuals in home isolation having to be carried to one of the other external centers because their level shifted from the green to the red? Thank you very, very much for that question. That is a very important question that I'm sure a lot of persons would want to know. So essentially, of those persons that we have identified up until this date, we've had to uh, send essentially uh, 100, and we have completed, I should say, transport of 122 of those persons. However, they are a further approximately 122 persons, if I'm looking at my dashboard, who are in the process of being collected. Those are persons who are red or persons who are yellow at this point in time and are actively going into facility. We also had at the point in time after making that first contact, we've had identified 37 persons by the time we got the first contact who had already been transported. So they were at the point of first contact, we understood that they were already within an isolation facility. So we have quite a number of persons who have already been transported to that facility to be formally assessed. They're either kept within that facility because the health provider team down there has identified these persons as, as being very severe and they require closer monitoring. And we are now looking towards uh, some of those persons who were done at that facility based upon, again, because it's all based upon a clinical assessment, some of those persons coming back out into the uh, community to continue their isolation process. A, question. a second question Sorry. to you, if I'm permitted. Right. Now, you spoke to Dr. Charles and the other doctors doing perhaps maybe some telechecks. Now, if individuals refuse to give their comorbidity status, etc., cetera, um, what's the next best solution outside of the telemedicine um, check to ensure that they don't slip from that green into that red and unfortunately maybe pass away at home. Right, so remember it's not only a telemedicine consultation. There are some persons, and, and doctors have uh, various reasons for going out and physically checking persons. It may be a declaration of symptoms, or in speaking to that person, because history taking and communicating with patients is not something that we have recently started since the COVID pandemic. This is part of what we do every single day. And there are going to be some persons that as you communicate with them, you get a sense that they're not communicating as accurately as they should. Not to mention you may hear three or four voices in the background at home uh, shouting or screaming. So you know that the situation as they're probably trying to paint that situation is not as accurate as it really is. If we have any questions about it, those are the persons that we do a further assessment on. So it's really a judgment based upon a, a clin and that's why I keep saying it's a clinical assessment. It's not really simply a hardcore. If you take a box and you go down, then yes, you automatically end up in um, telemed uh, on the, under the telemed group of persons. But it's really based upon that clinical assessment because our duty really is to keep you safe. There are some persons who, as I said earlier, who may not have any symptoms, but their social situation is such that if, for instance, we let's give an example. If we have a single mother at a home, she is positive but she has let's say six children are we going to keep that mom at home with the six children or are we going to as she needs care or are we going to escalate mommy to an 
in-house facility or central facility so that she can get care. Now, a number of things need to happen. We also need to know the status of the children, but certainly if mommy needs care, we need to escalate her care. But we also need to be able to provide for our mommy and the rest of her household. So we want to ensure that every single step of the way, everybody is safe. Not simply, possibly that positive person, but everybody in that household. You know that part of my responsibility is to get feedback from the public and to identify the concerns. And one concern which has been raised is where people have to go into isolation with their children, for instance. Uh, you may have a young child and that child tests positive and you have to accompany the child. Their concern is that at the end of the process, the employer says, but you are not sick. And since you are not sick, you are not entitled to the kind of uh, privileges that would accompany the situation of a person who was sick and therefore could deliver a sick certificate. And the question of pay and sometimes the attitude of the employer is something that they are worried about. Now, it's my understanding and the chief medical officer, acting chief medical officer of health, uh, could perhaps expand on this to some extent, but I, I recognize that this is a worry and it is something that has been put to the authorities on your behalf. Uh, Dr. Best, would you want to comment on that in any way? Sure, Ms. Ellis. Uh, the issue of quarantine and isolation was dealt with early in the pandemic uh, when we would have had discussions uh, with the National Insurance uh, Scheme. The agreement is, is that persons can be compensated for days away from work once the correct diagnosis is placed on the form. So even though the scenario that you painted is one in which the, the parent is accompanying the child and the child is one that is sick and the parent is not sick, the diagnosis for the parent is actually exposure to an infectious disease. So it can be compensated uh, under the the agreement with the National Insurance Department. And um, Dr. Grandison, the, the definition of triaging, which uh, somebody asked about, can you explain what is meant by triaging? Yes, please. I know that we as doctors, we, we sometimes often use terms that um, we assume that persons know, and I often have to knock myself on the head and say, Dana, break it all the way down. Yes, so triaging is the term um, that we use in medicine to be able to categorize a person in terms of whether, for instance, in this situation, whether this person is an urgent case that needs urgent intervention, some person that is of, of moderate concern or moderate priority, and that's a person that we monitor, but we will still send for intervention in terms of formal assessment, or some person who's safe. So we have a, a, a as I said, red light, green light, system uh, and the amber so red yellow and green and that is based upon level allowing us healthcare professionals to know the level of urgency in terms of which we need to intervene so for instance if a person is an extremist or let me take that term out again because again i'm using a term that's quite medical if the person is short of breath having difficulty breathing they're starting to to feel very, very unwell if they have, for instance, a blood pressure monitor at home and their heart rate is now going through the roof over 100 beats per minute, they have a roaring fever, they've passed out at home or what we call a loss of consciousness. All of these are things that we get very, very concerned about. So we don't want that person staying home or family members wasting time. That is a person we need to intervene immediately. So it's triaging, long and short is, it's just a categorization uh, process that we as doctors use to determine how quickly we need to see you and intervene and help. This person write, writes that they received a call on Tuesday that they were positive. They told the person their health ailments and to date, no one has contacted them. Now, that complaint has been coming from quite a number of people and now you understand the difficulty because if you if you have 1400 active cases in the community you will now appreciate the difficulty of being able to get to all of those people but what can you tell people in this situation who have this particular concern either dr grandison 
or Dr. Best. So I'll, take, I'll, I'll start off and take that question, and then I believe Dr. Best can also come in. Uh, so we have multiple hotlines on the island where if persons are starting or their status has changed, they're feeling unwell now, they can reach out. Uh, because this is a very new program, we are actually developing a call center specifically for persons who are in home isolation. This is going to be an internal number. So essentially, if you're in the program, we want to give you this number. Um, and that will be uh, available for persons within home isolation within the next few days. And this is because we don't want persons, I know a lot of persons may say, well, I call a hotline number and I'm like number 25 and something's really, really wrong. If it is an emergency, we ask you to call our emergency numbers that we have for general emergency on the island, which is 511 in case you are, because everyone thinks 911, but in a panic, it's really 511. However, during this period of time, until the next few days when that number becomes live, um, essentially you can call the hotline or you can even call your polyclinic doctor if you're, you're within the catchment area or your private doctor. We've had uh, situations where private doctors or polyclinic doctors have essentially been calling in and feeding some of that information back into us and we have been escalating the situation as needed. Um, but essentially we want to get a dedicated line for persons within the home isolation program that they can call and talk to one of our specialists who can directly communicate with the doctors and say, okay, I need a team out to that person so that that person can be reassessed as quickly as possible. Dr. Beth? Thanks. Um, so Dr. Grandison has essentially captured the process, but what I want to stress and want to re-emphasize is the fact that the, the numbers have overwhelmed the system. So the numbers have overwhelmed the system. It was only three weeks ago that we put this home isolation and home quarantine program into place. There's still a lot of teething issues. So what we need people to do is to understand that we understand the seriousness of the situation, um, understand that we are trying to address it, understand that this is new to us and we are trying our best to be able to get to everyone. Uh, this is a complaint that I get every single day. I get many telephone calls, WhatsApp messages, and emails from people who are frustrated and in isolation. So we, we deeply apologize on behalf of the, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, but we will get to you. You have to bear with us. We are working very hard and we're trying to get to every single person. I also need to emphasize that if you are in isolation, um, and you were dealt to be mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic and something has changed, you need to let someone know. We don't want you leaving your home or your hotel room if you're in isolation. We need you to call one of the emergency numbers, uh, the ambulance number 511, as Dr. Gradison just gave, or even call the hotline um, if it's not an emergency or call a medical practitioner or clinic to get advice. So the information is coming to us when we do have situations like that. We do funnel all information back to the command center. And we have been addressing all of those situations in which people need um, emergency care. Something has changed in the last few hours or in the last few days. We are trying to address all of those situations in those cases. We'll take a question from the media. Good morning, Carol Toppin from Starcom Network News. Um, I'm not sure. I think probably Dr. Best, you might be able to help here. I've had some concerns um, from families about the policy as it relates to handling the bodies of their loved ones who passed away due to COVID-19. What is the policy there? Because we're getting so many stories, people saying they can't um, have the kind of service that they would like, no open casket. What is the policy as it relates to handling the bodies of people who passed? So the policy in terms of handling uh, persons who have died from COVID, the, what we recommend from the Ministry of Health and Wellness is that the same infection prevention and control measures apply to the person who has died from COVID for the death care workers. So COVID, you're still infectious um, when you're dead and we want to protect the death care workers. So the standard procedures of infection prevention and control wearing PPE apply. What also applies to the management of a dead body is that autopsies are not done if the person has definitely died from COVID. 
The reason why autopsy is not done is because you may do something called aerosol generation, um, where you get the COVID-19 uh, particles or virus particles in the air, and then that puts the death care workers at risk. So that's the most important thing that uh, persons should appreciate. Um, it's interesting, you directed the question to me, but Dr. Grandison is actually uh, working on this particular area with the coroner's office, where she, uh, in a different capacity, goes to the homes of persons who have died, uh, suspected cases of COVID, um, or to the funeral homes to, to do a swap, because it is important for us to know how this person died. We can do a rapid test on a dead body, and we can do the standard PCR tests for COVID-19 on a dead body. Dr. Grandison, I don't know if you want to add to anything that I've said. Yes, I think you actually summed it up quite beautifully. Uh, for those persons who, we, who have died at home and we are not sure of their status, and we are concerned that this person may be COVID positive because it has implications for not only the person that has died in terms of knowing the public health information, but certainly it has an implication for the persons who are living within that home and how we help them afterwards. Um, so as Dr. Best would have stated, we do swab those persons, um, whether it is on site in very few cases or when that body is transported to the funeral home. And those cases are actually expedited through uh, the uh, public health lab so that we are fully aware of what additional measures need to be taken. From there, those, that data is uh, sent back to the coroner's office where the coroner can make an informed decision certainly to protect not only the death care workers at the funeral home, but also the pathologist uh, in terms of uh, documenting or doing an autopsy. As Dr. Best said, we do not perform aut autopsies here in Barbados on persons who are COVID positive because we need to make sure that our pathologists stay safe. So really, uh, swabbing and, and detection of COVID positivity status is all about safety and, and also the de-escalation of, uh, de of a situation so that it does not impact the other persons around you. And if need be, the escalation of your care so that we can treat you as appropriately and as safely as possible so that you can return to community. Uh, as doctors, we, we struggle daily, and you can ask any of the ones in accident and emergency, and all the doctors across Barbados, BAP doctors, public doctors, private doctors, we don't like to hear when we lose patients. It's something that we get very, very upset about. So we really want to intervene early. And if we can swab the dead in order to assist the living, we do that. Dr. Grandison, are you in a position to share with us information on how many, how many seriously ill patients we have in the country at the moment? Yes, I can. Just let me go back to that spreadsheet for you. Just give me one quick second. So right now, at this point in time, we have 22 urgent cases that are currently out in community that are being collected as we speak. And we can say that quite comfortably because when I look at this dashboard, there are many stakeholders that can view this dashboard um, from a public health standpoint, as well as our uh, uh, command or operations center, essentially. And those are the persons who mobilize our transport persons. Um, so essentially, as soon as a person is triaged, it's not an email that is sent, it's not a phone call that he's saying there's no delay. They can see immediately um, those persons who are flagged as red or urgent, and then they mobilize a team to collect those persons immediately. The yellow persons are collected and transported within a 24 hour period. And that is as it relates to those in community. That doesn't touch in community. Those, that doesn't touch on those that are in isolation facilities. We will have to get Correct. that information from. Uh, Harrison Point, somebody else. Um, absolutely. Okay, let's take another question from the media. Um, I didn't, Carol Toppin again, I didn't quite get an answer to the part of that question. One, are open caskets allowed for people who die from COVID-19?
Dr. Grandison, do you know? No, so generally, as, as Dr. Bless would have stated, the public health measures for infectious diseases is observed. So we try to ensure that even at the point of burial, that an open casket is not allowed because then you have persons who are there in the space with their body who can potentially become infected and we don't want that. So essentially we try to expedite those cases to get them buried as quickly and as safely as possible. But we do understand that family members do need closure um, and so we try to accommodate as much as possible, but certainly not an open casket because we cannot expose our death care workers and we do not want to expose family members. Thank you. So as a matter of policy, finally, is there a, a period by which you recommend the, the passing of that individual and when they should be buried? Yes, please. What's that timeline? Uh, we try to be, we need to essentially get the information in as timely a manner as possible so we try to get that information in from the police officers at reporting at the center they usually tend to report in quite a timely fashion then i am informed of this through the coroner's office once the swab is taken and the swab is reported because the swab has to be reported then they will release the body for a burial generally that tends to be done within once all goes well uh, I want to say between 24 to 72 hours. That's what we aim to do. Thank you. And if you want to follow up, you can actually follow up also with the coroner's office of Barbados. Let's take another question from the media. Who's next? Well, you work that out. Let, let me pose this question, which has been sent to us from a member of the public. <laughs> If an individual or individuals are home quarantined, would all family members and members of that household be quarantined in that home as well until that positive person is cleared? If the answer is yes, here's a follow-up question to be asked. If another family member tests positive during that home quarantine period, it would mean all family members will have to remain quarantined at home. My concern is the mental health challenges that could result from families restricted to their homes for an extended period of time. How do you respond to that? All right. So Ms. Ellis asks a great question. The, so let us not confuse quarantine and isolation. Um, they seem similar, but quarantine is going to apply to those persons who are exposed, potentially exposed to the disease. Isolation is going to apply to the persons who are actually COVID cases. So they have a positive COVID-19 test. But what is similar between quarantine and isolation is that when somebody is quarantining in their home or isolating in their home, we apply the rule to the entire household and not just to the individual. So you have a situation in which somebody is in quarantine and they're in home, the entire household has to be in quarantine as well. If you have a situation in which somebody's isolating because they're ill and you're quarantining the others because they're not ill, once again, everybody has to remain at home for the period. Obviously, we are trying to contain the spread of uh, an infectious disease. The latter part of the question was a tougher part of the question is dealing with the mental health of persons who are at home for such a long period. We are highly cognizant that this is a potential outcome. We, are, we would not want mental ill health to happen because of that. And that is why for the persons who are isolated, we do try to get them into a facility. Um, but in the situation that we're faced with now where the, the isolation facilities are full and we have no choice but to resort to home isolation, um, there's nothing that we can do about that in terms of of placement of those persons. If you have a situation in which you have a mental health emergency, you have people being stressed and people being agitated, you have to let us know because we can intervene. We, we try to intervene preemptively by involving the Ministry of People Empowerment um, and Elder Affairs in terms of provision of, of social assessment, um, sorry, social health. So if persons you know, can't get to the, well, obviously they can't get to the grocery, they can't get somebody to assist them with buying food items, we can come to you. And the Operation Command Center is geared 
towards that. So we are we're preemptively looking for that. However, dealing with the psychological aspect, we are still going to, to help with that um, if there's any indication that there's something happening that we need to pay close attention to. The command center being made aware would contact the relevant department or agency because we can go in and we can do something in that case. I don't know if Dr. Grandison wants to add to that. I also want to add that we have as part of our team uh, of triagers, we actually have a psychiatrist as part of our team. And uh, she is quite willing uh, via telemed that if there are some persons at, at the point of triaging, if they're having any concerns, that they can actually uh, state that they would like to have um, a psychological follow-up essentially because we know that person's mental health is very important here in Barbados. I think we should really move to gone are the days where we look very poorly on mental health but mental health is very very important so if you are having any challenges um, when the triage team contacts you and you would like to speak to a psychiatrist even if it is just to get all those feelings off your chest um, please let us know so that we can also mobilize that doctor so that she can speak to you via telemed as the first layer. And as Dr. Beth said, then we can get other healthcare workers as necessary to intervene for persons who may either have a psychiatric emergency or otherwise. One important question though is, and what happens to the healthcare professionals who are under stress and have been for so long? they are important too in all of this so what is being done for them people like yourself yeah fantastic question um, mental health is actually one of my pet areas in terms of um, from a public health perspective I I think there's a lot more that we can do um, from the Ministry of Health perspective and then from a government perspective in terms of sensitizing people about the importance of good mental health and understanding what mental ill health is all about um, during the pandemic, uh, and it goes without saying, mental health has been impacted on, for so many people, for many frontline workers, for essential workers, for those of us working in the EOC, for all of us working in some form or fashion um, with the COVID program, um, uh, such as Dr. Grandison, such as us in the EOC, as I just mentioned. The, we do have a program in place. We do utilize the services of uh, the network services. We also utilize the, the psychological and the psychiatric services of the psychiatric hospital. So we do have support coming from in-house, but then we also have a, a program where we have to outsource counseling, um, and we do that through network services. Thank you. Uh, Carlos Atwell from The Nation, I think you wanted to raise a question as well. Uh, yes, please. Uh, apologies for before. Uh, my question is to Dr. Grandison. Can you say how many people have been issued with ankle monitors? I'm hoping they hear me this time. Yes, looking at the spreadsheets. I always have to look at the spreadsheets to get this information. Um, so as of yesterday, I knew the, the yesterday's number off the top of my head. As of yesterday, we had 17 persons who had actually been fitted with ankle bracelets. And these are persons who, believe it or not, are green. Persons who we consider low priority persons because we know that a person who is low priority, who's most likely not having any symptoms, is the head person who will say, well, I don't feel any way, I don't have any symptoms. I may not even have COVID and may attempt to walk around in community, may attempt to leave home. Um, from what I'm seeing coming in on the dashboard, currently we have 27. We have teams out in, in community right now actually placing those bracelets. And, and so I believe by the end of today, those bracelet numbers will actually go up. Um, but yes, we, we ask that you essentially uh, see favorably. It's, it's really not um, an intrusion of your privacy, but we want to make sure that your community members are safe. We've had situations where persons essentially have, have thought, well, I, I don't have any symptoms. There's no way I could have COVID. Uh, and we've seen this here internationally. We're persons who have COVID diagnoses 
um, and are asymptomatic sometimes can, whether vaccinated or not, can spread the virus to other persons. So we want to keep our community safe. And I, I can't help but say over and over, uh, safety is, is the number one game. And, and that is how uh, we are able to stem the tide as it relates to um, the escalation and, and increase, dramatic increase in cases. We need to go back to the basics, the hand washing, the mask wearing, and might I add, if you are in a home with some person who is even quarantined as a primary contact, we want to encourage you within the home to wear your mask. If you're in a home with a person who is in isolation, and it really that person should be confined to their room, please, please wear a mask. Delta is extremely contagious. Why is it contagious? Generally speaking, if we could break it down to very easy terms, and I hope I'm not really going off track too much, but I, I want to break this down to you. The spike protein that was on the wild type of COVID, I want you to see it as a stiff arm, an arm that didn't have an elbow, no wrist. So essentially, if it lines up with the ACE2 receptor and it binds, okay, then the virus can enter because the spike protein is that key to open the door to get into your cell. Delta, however, because of the actual uh, configuration of the spike protein, the mutation in the spike protein that has occurred, it now has an elbow and it also now has a wrist. So it's flexible. So if it pushed to the, directly in front of it and it doesn't get anything, it could flick left or right essentially to see if it sees an ACE2 receptor anywhere close by. So the chances of it binding increase, which means if it is within your space and you inhale this virus, or it, for instance, gets into contact with the eyes, which certainly is also a lot of persons generally don't get too concerned with the eyes. We always remember the nose and the mouth, but remember the eyes can be a potential exposure point. Then it is a lot easier for you to get infected. So what does that mean? We need to wear our masks and we need to wear them properly. So yes, we are having those persons who essentially um, are, are well and have no symptoms out in community. We are getting them fitted with those ankle bracelets first. Any follow-up question from you, Mr. Atwell? Yes, please. I just want to find out what uh, I should update this first. I just want to find out um, the, the same ankle monitors, how, how, how are they monitored as in what program is being used so you know what happens with the people wearing them? And have there been any problems so far? So far, we've not had any problems. Uh, the monitoring actually occurs every single minute. We are collecting information on the movement of that person. And purposely so, we want to know if that person is in breach of isolation. And this is really an opportunity for you to follow the actual protocols that have been implemented, implemented on the island to ensure that your community and your loved ones are safe. So in short, they are monitored every single minute there's a minute correspondence that's sent out, okay? We have told persons that we ask them not to tamper with the bracelet. I can tell you from actually seeing these bracelets myself, it is extremely difficult to get these bracelets off or if you tamper with them, it will send off a trigger to the monitoring facility, allowing persons to know you are tampering with the bracelet. You can shower with the bracelet, you can sleep with the bracelet. The bracelet is charged every 24 hours. Uh, and, and all of that communication is communicated back to the monitoring facility, allowing us to know if that bracelet, for instance, if you don't charge it every 24 hours, it will send you a message initially to let you know you need to charge your bracelet. However, if you ignore that message, then the monitoring facility themselves will call you and tell you you need to charge your bracelet. So we're giving you essentially two opportunities to intervene and charge your bracelet. If you do not charge your bracelet because everyone is issued with a charger, we then get very, very concerned that you essentially, you don't want to charge your monitor. And again, it will continue to notify us and allow us to know that that intervention has not been performed. This um, question is about home isolation. The person says, I have been told to um, home isolate, and uh, this has been five days. 
I'm asthmatic and I don't have any symptoms and I'm feeling good. What is the next step for my status and where do I go from here? In addition, they say, I have not been contacted since the call from the contact tracer. As you can see, it has been over 48 hours. What's your response to that concern? Now, as Dr. Best stated, we do have, and I said first contact, right now in our, our community, we have approximately just over 700 persons who have had that first contact, but they are now also waiting to be formally triaged, and that's the first line of triage point. So we want to ensure to get those persons triaged as quickly as possible. We have doctors and EMTs and nurses right on the lines as we speak that are currently taking that backlog off um, and essentially trying to ensure that persons are triaged as quickly as possible. And this is the reality of the rapid increase in cases that we've had. So I do apologize to that person who has not been triaged as yet, but we will be getting to you shortly. I don't know if Dr. Best probably wants to, to give some additional comment. Not at this point. I wonder to, to what extent does this move to home isolation impact on people who are coming into Barbados? Has that necessitated any change in how we deal with the visitor? Uh, the, so home isolation has not changed the protocols for persons who are traveling into Barbados that require, um, who require quarantine, basically. Um, the current protocol is, of course, that for the fully vaccinated traveler, uh, they come with a negative test done three days before arrival. They get a, a test on arrival and the quarantine ends. Um, for the unvaccinated traveler, you're going to be in quarantine for five days before getting a test to end the quarantine. The home isolation has indirectly impacted the traveler because the resources, it's the same resources, it's the same lab doing the testing, and in many instances, it's the same people responsible for the overall management of COVID, responsible for isolation, who are also doing the quarantine. So what unfortunately has happened is that there's a backlog um, at the lab, um, no more than 48 hours, I, I might add. And in some cases, people are in quarantine for longer than anticipated. So that is the only impact that the home isolation effort has had. But that is a consequence of the high incidence of COVID-19 in Barbados. The systems are just burdened. Kareem Smith. Hey, good morning. Uh, my question is for Dr. Grandison. What are the penalties for persons found in breach of, of the terms and conditions of their home isolation um, regime? I, I, I actually, I can tell you what they are, but I think that that's more a public health question to Dr. Best. So I think that Dr. Best really should be the correct person to answer that question for you. So as articulated in law, that you can face a fine up to $50,000. And I believe there's a prison term of up to six months. But I speak subject to correction with regards to the, the prison part of it. It is articulated in our home isolation and home quarantine guidelines and this is guidelines for the persons who are in home quarantine and in home isolation. So Dr. Grandison, I don't know if you want to clarify anything that I've just said. Uh, Dr. Bessie is correct about the, the monetary fine. Um, however, I think recently it has been amended to increase to one year. Um, so, so just so that you're aware, we don't want any person spending unnecessary money that they do not have. So we want to encourage you, please, please do not violate the home isolation measures. And certainly, we know that a lot of you enjoy the comfort of your home, and we would not want for you to be brought before the law courts to face imprisonment of up to one year. So essentially, I'm just asking you to try to remain safe, stay at home, and follow the protocols. Any follow-up, uh, Mr. Smith? Yeah. I have a question, for, another question for Dr. Best. And that is, to what extent has the current surge in cases affected the ability of our healthcare professionals to tend to 
critically ill patients on a regular basis. The reason I'm asking is because we have been getting a number of calls. We haven't really been able to get balance to these stories from our healthcare professionals because they're busy. But persons are saying that they have relatives who may have contacted them on the phone um, in the morning time saying that their, their condition has started to deteriorate and they have been unable to get anything. And there's one case in particular where a relative had died and the, the reason that was given was just we, we simply didn't know that he had gotten so bad. So how often are critically ill persons, persons in primary and secondary isolation being monitored and to what extent does this current situation affect their ability to receive the necessary care? So, so Kareem, I thought your initial question was about the impact of COVID on non-COVID health-related problems. But specifically, you're asking about the impact within the COVID isolation facilities? Yes. So th there definitely has been an impact on the COVID isolation facilities. That's a, a question that's a lot easier to answer. Um, the challenge is, is that you have the same resources that were managing the, the cases back in August, you have the same resources managing significantly more cases. Um, and whereas in the past we had two isolation facilities, we are now at eight isolation facilities to manage persons and the resources are stretched. So even in a situation where we need more doctors um, to, to manage, there's simply no more doctors out there who are, who are available or who are willing to come forward and work in, in the isolation facilities. So unfortunately, the level of care that we are accustomed to is going to be impaired. So then is, is it reasonable to suggest, again, I am getting calls from persons who on a day-to-day -day basis are grieving or are extremely concerned about the health of their um, relative. Is it then reasonable to say that the like, level of a person succumbing to COVID-19 now because of it, it's much higher than uh, August, July, June. Sorry, Kareem, you broke up a bit just now, so I didn't hear the last part of the question. My apologies. I was asking whether, based on your assessment, then is it reasonable to suggest that the likelihood of some person dying from COVID now, just strictly because of those shortages, is much higher than in? Um, June, July, when the situation was a bit... Uh, so, so, Kareem, I'm going to answer it this way. If we have more cases of COVID straining the system with the same level of resources, we're getting to, uh, we're getting to a situation in Barbados where we've maximized resources from the Ministry of Health, the QEH, and from government. We cannot do any more. We're getting to that situation, and that is why I use the term dire. We are in a dire situation. Okay, so how I prefer to answer that question is when you have a situation like that and it continues to get worse, it will mean that the level of care that we would like to provide is going to go down. It will mean that in some cases, some persons who are sicker will get, will, will, will unfortunately die. So the potential is there. This person um, is asking whether in the case of persons returning from travel abroad, are they allowed to quarantine at home whilst awaiting test results? Um, awaiting a PCR test result, um, and this person says that they're fully uh, vaccinated, so can they quarantine at home, the traveler? I think we're a bit frozen, it seems. I think, uh, Adana, are you there? Uh, seem to be, um, you seem to be frozen. Yes, I, I, I think that Dr. Best, he's, he's, he's frozen, both of yeah. us had a bit of a glitch, um, but yeah. I think that I'm back now. Um, so essentially, at this point in time, uh, home quarantine, uh, as we have envisioned it, um, is not fully up and running as yet. Um, however, there are persons who can apply directly for home quarantine to the uh, CMO uh, acting at this point in time via email uh, stating so that they will be handed, handled on a case-by-case -case basis and within the next few days to weeks and this is because all of our home quarantine doctors are essentially helping in the home isolation effort 
And, and as Dr. Best stated, you know, we, we have a very finite amount of doctors on the island. And a lot of our doctors and healthcare professionals are working, doing two and three different jobs. They may work in their private clinic. They may then assist with vaccination. They may also assist with the isolation facility or a quarantine facility within the hotels, as we know that that was happening before. So long and short of, of your, um, your, your question, that the answer to your question is that at this point in time, uh, persons can apply directly to the CMO's office, and those cases will be handled on a case-by-case -case basis. However, when we officially launch the other part of home quarantine, uh, there will be an application process where persons can submit their application formally and they will get communication. That will be handled uh, by essentially my cohort of doctors um, that are working right now with the home isolation effort. Do we have another question from the media? Yeah. Yes. Good morning. Uh, this is Carl here again. Um, just want to. I want to go back to the uh, body issue. Some people are saying they're having issues uh, collecting their loved ones' bodies from the funeral homes. Uh, can we speak about that? To whom are you directing the question? Uh, I, I suppose Dr. Grandison. I, I would not be able to completely speak on that matter because I don't know exactly where, for instance, that body would be in the process. Um, what I can tell you what the process is, which is essentially once notification um, to the police has been made that the person has died at home, that body uh, of um, a death, uh, a natural death form is filled out. That a natural death form is submitted to the coroner's office. The coroner's office makes a determination based upon the circumstances surround that death if that body needs to be swabbed. As I said, when that uh, request is then made uh, for us to go in and swab that body, that body is swabbed, the swab result is communicated back to the coroner's office, and then the coroner's office will make a determination in terms of, based upon the result of the swab, uh, if it is that that body goes for a post-mortem, if that body, uh, the person essentially has a negative COVID swab, and the cause of their death is unknown or not clearly um, understood um, because there are many reasons why you may do a post-mortem. However, if it is that the person is COVID positive, we uh, attempt to, ex well, not we, the coroner's office attempts to expedite um, that case so that that person can either be sent for a closed casket burial or cremation so that their family can start to heal because that's essentially what needs to happen. Closure must be obtained. Okay. We're going to wrap up at uh, 10, 15, 11, 15. Uh, this person wants the email address to apply to the CMO for home quarantine when returning from travel. Dr. Bess, um, his communication with us broke, and I believe he's just rejoined us. Dr. Bess, are you there? Yes. Hi, Ms. Ellis. Sorry about that. Yes. What's the email address uh, to apply to the CMO for home quarantine if a person is coming back or coming to Barbados from traveling? The email address is cmo at health.gov.bb or dcmo at health.gov.bb. I suppose you should repeat it because it's quick. Sure. CMO at health.gov.bb. The second email address, the alternative is dcmo at health.gov.bb. And if you go onto the Barbados Travel Protocols online, you will find the numbers that you can call and the email addresses as well. At this stage, uh, Dr. Bass, I'd like you to summarize basically where Barbados is right now for those people who might have joined us late. Thanks a lot uh, again, Ms. Dallas. The situation that we are seeing right now is a grave situation where the rate of cases of COVID is extremely high and it's getting even higher. So two days ago, we would have reported that we had 318 new cases. I believe that was on the 4th. And then yesterday, we had 300 new cases. 
These rates are rates that we're not accustomed to. It therefore means we have more active cases than ever before, and it therefore means that our isolation facilities are overwhelmed. And this is why the Ministry of Health and the government of Barbados would have started a home isolation program three weeks ago. And uh, Dr. Grandison would have been talking about the program um, on the media a few times. What we need for people to do, um, Ms. Dallas, is to understand the seriousness of this pandemic. This pandemic is a deadly pandemic. Our priority is to save lives. We are going to save lives if we can detect people. So if you are exposed um, to somebody who may have had COVID or somebody who definitely has COVID, we need you to come forward and get tested. If you're diagnosed with COVID, we need you to isolate. If you, it's home isolation, we need you to adhere to all of the protocols and guidelines and the laws in, in terms of staying home and isolating. Isolation is to your advantage, but it's also to the advantage of the community and for the public health because it limits your interaction and your ability to spread COVID-19 to others. And obviously, if you are vulnerable, if you have a comorbidity, if you're unvaccinated, the chances of you having moderate or severe disease is significantly higher. So therefore, we will triage you. Dr. Grandison would have gone through that, that process. The ones that are red are flagged and sent to Harrison's Point. The ones that are yellow are assessed whether at the Blackman and Gollop School or at the Harrison's Point facility. And a determination is made, do we need this person in isolation so we can monitor them for their benefit to make sure that they, they, uh, that they get the best possible care and that they do not die. But let us also talk about prevention. So there are two main things that I want to leave with you about prevention. And the first is vaccinations. Vaccines are safe and effective. Vaccines will reduce transmission, yes, but more importantly, it will reduce the severity of disease. Right now, we're seeing just about 40% of the total population being vaccinated. More people are coming forward and getting vaccinated, even people who were hesitant and skeptical before. And we are encouraging that, and we want to continue to encourage that. But for us to get through this pandemic, we need more people to be vaccinated against COVID-19, okay? and. The other thing is we need people to understand the other non-pharmaceutical uh, interventions that are stipulated and that are recommended. So we don't want people liming, partying. We don't want people breaking the law. We need to limit interactions of people so we can contain the spread as best as possible. There are protocols out there for that reason. We understand that a lot of people are breaking those protocols. It is hurting all of us more people are dying from COVID-19 because we are not limiting the spread as best as we could. So while we are out to all, from the Ministry of Health and the QH perspective, we need the cooperation, we need the assistance of the public of Barbados in this endeavor. Thank you very much, Dr. Anton Best. And thanks also to Dr. Adana Grandison, the members of the media and the members of the public who have raised their questions. All I can say to you is that many people in this country said no to a lockdown. And you didn't get a lockdown. But what is happening here has the potential to undermine this country's development and its growth. And it is up to each and every one of us to recognize the severity of the situation that confronts us today. The doctors have given you the picture it is now up to each and every one of us to go back into our communities, into our homes, and do the right thing. Follow the protocols, and if you can be vaccinated, then do so. I'm David Ellis. Do have a good day.